Um, our program is, oh, everybody go ahead and consent to um, the recording session if that's okay with you. If it's not, this session is going to be going up onto YouTube after um, the end of the session, so other people who weren't able to make it um, can still participate. Um, so yeah, our, our um, virtual shadowing session was created in response to the COVID virus as many um, pre-health students are thrown off their tracks um, for in terms of shadowing and getting experience in their potential fields. So hopefully this can help out with that. Um, I'm one of the co-founders. My name is Nina Guzmando Bernstein and I'm currently a second year undergrad biology student at UC Merced. Hi, I'm Rafael Danase. I'm one of the co-founders of PHS. I'm a fourth year undergrad cognitive science major in UC Merced and with a minor in community research and service. At this time, I would like to introduce our spotlight speaker for today, Dr. Catherine Valois, who is currently um, a pediatric doctor at the Kaiser Permanente in San Leandro. California. Welcome, Catherine, Dr. Valois. Sorry. Hi, everybody. <laughs> this is my first time doing something like this, too. Um, certainly, lots of things have changed um, due to the pandemic, and uh, I'm happy to help out. So, um, awesome. So we're going to start off just by giving a little bit introduction. Um, tell us a little bit about yourself, who you are, um, what is your job, and uh, yeah, we can start off with that. Sure. Um, I, since I was little, I wanted to be a veterinarian, and then I decided to be, go into biology. I always liked growing and, and learning about how living things operated, and um, so I, I majored in um, biology in college in, at Reed College in Oregon. And then after that, I thought I would go to into um, like research and bench work. And I worked in a lab for a couple of years and then worked in another lab doing research for a couple of years before I finally went to med school at State University of New York in uh, Brooklyn, New York. And then uh, residency, I, at that point I decided to do pediatrics, I thought I wanted to do briefly considered psych, psych psychiatry, but found that very depressing. <laughs> and then um, wanted to do, I thought of briefly about surgery, but it's pretty intense and not very friendly to certain personalities, but I liked the craft of it. And, um, but then I really liked the small people. So went into pediatrics and I did my residency at Long Island Jewish Medical Center, um, or otherwise known as Schneider Children's Hospital in Long Island, New York, and then came out here when I, we were expecting our first kids to, and I got my first job here, my one and only job at the Permanente Medical Group here in California, where I've worked for 16 years now. No, close, longer than that. 17 years. Um, I'm a pediatrician, so that usually, I'm a general outpatient pediatrician, so that means I take care of children from birth to 18 in our practice, it goes up to 18, sometimes a little longer, depending on what's going on with the particular kid. Um, and I'm a general pediatrician, so I don't, I used to do I used to do, when I first started, I used to do inpatient work and I did, took call and I worked in the NICU and in the emergency room and stuff. But then after a couple of years, I just switched to all outpatient pediatrics. Since I've started um, practicing in pediatrics, there's been a much more of a, a separation between generalists and um, there's a new, I think it's, it's virtually true in all medicine now that there's hospitalists and there's outpatient generalists. About that. Uh, 
Oh, this I put I put this together just to give an idea of what um because pediatric training usually you start with um, under the umbrella of general pediatrics when you do a pediatric residency you can go into many different subspecialties just like there are adult subspecialties so anything from um, adolescent medicine to uh, neonatology to uh, rheumatology to neurology did I, um, all the subspecialists based on different body systems some that are particular to children like pediatric child abuse or adolescent medicine um, and obviously neonatologists um, you can learn end up working as a doctor with primarily pediatric patients by going through another route like through a surgical subspecialty or another subspecialty like pediatric orthopedic surgery or pediatric head and neck surgery or um, those are basically the surgery or anesthesiology subspecialties so that's just sort of an umbrella of all the what uh, pediatric subspecialties are but i'm just playing on general pediatrics but i um it's that, that usually takes a lot more training after your three years of residency for pediatrics before you get an additional certification Um, can I ask why you chose general pediatrics above everything else? Well, one of the other subspecialties, other um, uh, kinds of medicine I had been considering for a time when I was in med school was family practice. Um, I enjoy the idea of taking care of a child through their years of life and you really get to know a particular family and can really make a difference for one particular family and especially if you have multiple children and i've now reached the dubious age of saying that i'm a grand pediatrician some of my <laughs> pediatric patients former pediatric patients are now having children and entering my practice but um that's what appealed to me it was the fact that you could really i think the only other specialty that um really Takes, sorry about my door. Um, really um, sees into the family as a whole would be maybe family practice because they do everything. They do pediatrics and geriatrics and OBGYN and stuff. That's, a, that's um, much more general. So that's, that's what appealed to me. I briefly thought about at the end of pediatric residency, some people were encouraging me to go into um, neonatology I just was tired at that point <laughs> and wanted to just start working and not do more years of residency, basically. What's some experiences you had before you become like a doctor, like pediatrics doctor? I, I guess, are you meaning like the route to med school? <laughs> okay. <laughs> um, well, I kind of mentioned it a little bit before. I, I, re, I started working um, at a lab doing mass cell culture and then um, decided that wasn't for me. I tried to get into medical school the first time and I actually didn't get in. But I, then I worked more on basically my resume and stuff and I um, worked doing research for another year or so in, in New York doing endocrinology research and um, radioamino assays, and then um, got some better recommendations under my belt and got into medical school after that, so. Do you have any advice for students um, who did not get into medical school for the first time but are still looking to become doctors? I would imagine it's the same as what I would have thought when I went back then, because um, it's been a while, <laughs> is, is, you know, get experience and you might need to volunteer, you might need to get some research, you, you might, you know, pub publish, you might um, work in a hospital in some other way, you know, there, there, you don't have to necessarily 
jump right in after college. I think you have kind of, ha I mean, you can have some other experiences under your belt. We had one actor who had, was it, filmed a movie in his first year of medical school. We had a couple lawyers that decided they didn't like law, went into medical school. So, uh, you know, there's, you don't have to be the traditional route, just get more experience. Thank you. Oh. Yes, can you tell us a little bit about, you touched that you did some research um, a little bit during your undergrad. Can you talk a little bit more about um, your research that you did and how you got into that? I think a lot, I mean, that I just basically landed in a lab because I had microbial um, background and um, bio background and, you know, and, but, um, I think that there's some people are way more ambitious about research right in right now. I think it's I, I think schools are looking for, you can be a star in research, but you can also be well rounded in, in you know, I, I'm again, it's been a f many years, but when I worked in the lab, I think it helps that I was working actually in a hospital doing research um, that was affiliated with a hospital. So we were in a pediatric endocrinology group and we were trying to develop antibodies for um, particular hormones to be used in um, assays, like developing antibodies that could be used to be tagged, tag and eventually be able to measure new hormone levels and stuff. So this was many years ago, but it helps that I could also attend, you know, conferences pretty much weekly from the pediatric endocrinology group there. Um, that was, interesting that probably influenced me in some ways to going into pediatrics but I did research in, in college I had I had to write a thesis and stuff in on uh, on uh, telomeres <laughs> but again I think tech, techniques have advanced a lot since then Thank you. So now um, we would want to know a little bit in your day to day job as a pediatric doctor. Are there any interesting cases that you've encountered that you'd be willing to share with us? You can get medical with it. <laughs> so there's many different things from real life bezoars, you know, like Harry Potter's Potter style <laughs> hairballs for people <laughs> to <laughs> to um, just ex experiences, of, even simple things, the way things present can be different every time, you know? Um, and, and, and honest, what else? Let me think of some other things. Students, also, I would like to um, let you know that the chat is open for questions. Um, so if you guys have anything that pops up in your mind, feel free to type it in the chat um, and we can probably get to it sometime during this session. I, think, I mean, I, I'm, I'm sorry, I'm having trouble thinking of a particular case. I think the oh. most interesting cases that you end up remembering most are the ones that are personally impactful and maybe it's because you know the family for so long or learning uh, you know it's more the personal interactions um, like figuring out how to present like if I suspect for instance this is a for instance it's the, the most challenging part, I think, is actually now that everything's online and you can look things up with a snap, um, you don't have to remember everything so much anymore, but you do know we have to, where to ask for help and, and um, know your limits and know where to find out things um, on the, uh, on the, like, and be able to figure that out. So I think the most challenging part of, of being in pediatrics in particular is actually dealing with the families and the parents, like for in, oh, like for here, for one, like for one instance, uh, there was a baby that the family was very, very gung ho 
about um, breastfeeding this newborn. And if you knew my stand on that, you would know that I fully, fully support breastfeeding because it makes such huge impacts for the lives of the, um, yes, I'm, this question, do you ever, the difficult parents, I full on support breastfeeding. However, the, this family, I think they had a huge mistrust of of medicine in general and and any power structure in general i you got intimation intimations that they were you know uh, you know the people that stole away things for the third for the end of the world and stuff they were they were this mom only wanted to breastfeed her baby but the baby was not gaining weight at all and she, they were very um adverse to even being honest with you, you, they would change their story of how often the baby was nursing. And, and so you, you got this, you could never get a straight answer from them, um, like what was going on. And by a month old, the baby was still not back to birth weight. And at this point, you know, this kid's brain is not growing. The kids can, you know, not growing at all. It's very, you're supposed to have, you know, maybe doubled your birth weight by three months and this baby at one month was still below birth weight. And so they were just so resistant to just offering supplementation or, or pumping. And it, it, it ended up being a CPS case and they ended up losing that baby temporarily because they were starving the kid. So, so, but that, you know, things like that were the dynamics or families that are resistant to hearing that there's something wrong with their child who, who I suspect may be autistic you know, when you know that early intervention makes such a huge difference, it's like, how do you navigate and how do you, when, when your, your patient is the child, but you have to deal with the parents who are the parents of the child, they have their rights to, to take, you know, it's their child, so, but if they're in denial, it's just these deny dynamics are the most interesting and difficult things, I think, right now, in, for me, um, so that was a case of difficult parents. <laughs> so, so um, do you want to? Yeah, I have one question that's coming up um, that seems pretty relevant to what you just talked about. Um, this one question is, does CPS become involved frequently in pediatric medicine? And can you just talk about a little bit overview of what CPS is? Oh, Child Protective Services, it, it's, if you, we are mandated reporters, any doctor is, as in any teacher, it means that if you suspect, you do not even have to, you don't have to confirm and you don't have to point finger and you don't have to decide who or what, but if you suspect that a child is being um, physically or emotionally or um, ne neglected or uh, abused physically, and uh, you have to report to the state, to the county is basically and then they decide to investigate or not and to, to make, take action or not. So, so it, do, it does come up, it's very difficult, especially if you know the family. Um, and it's even more awkward when they come back, <laughs> like, but you have to just, you know, sometimes some families need a little help <laughs> and then they get the help and, um, so in the, in the question of how do you determine if you have a suspicion that a child you know, is being abused, you get training on what to look for, basically. And there's certain things that we know um, are suspicious for abuse. Um, can you talk about some of the things that they teach you uh, about um, identifying um, probable causes? Like pretty deep in there, <laughs> but like patterns uh, of bruising. <laughs> Patterns of bruising and locations of bruising, um, changing stories if a kid shows up to the emergency room with an injury that's suspicious, and then ha one t one parent says one thing and the other parent says another thing that's suspicious, you know, or sometimes the child themselves will disclose. That's another difficult time is when se separated families and often use the kid as the person in between and end up calling CPS on each other all the time. That's <laughs> when you have, you know, contentious divorces, that's not fun to deal with. Um, 
some, <laughs> we can keep going with that, but somebody else, like how I picked Kaiser, um, yeah. <laughs> which um, when I, one thing I learned, and this will go in, because I'm, I've been very fortunate, I think, to be sheltered from a lot of the healthcare marketplace because I work for Kaiser. Um, um, when I was doing my outpatient training, like my shadowing as a resident with my one of my um, mentors, um, I would he would he was in a small private practice of uh, three. I think there was three physicians in that group. So they had a their so their private practice. I, I swear, about a third of his time was devoted to working and a third of his staff as well. Everything, a third of the whole office operations was involved with um, billing insurance, coding for insurance, <laughs> and calling insurance and getting approvals from insurance that like a third of, the, at least a third of his time. So that made a huge impact. And then when I, I moved it, just timing wise, when I moved out here and was looking for jobs, cause I moved out here for family reasons, um, I started researching it when I saw the job offer at Kaiser and I, and like, wow, like you can be automatically plugged into a place where you don't have to worry about the insurance. You don't have to worry about coding. You don't have to worry about billing and whether something is co covered or not. And you're plugged into a group of, of subspecialists, like all, every single one of those subspecialists that I listed in, um, in the pediatric sub is all with within a, a phone call wave to me so I came with a pre-built network which is I think would be difficult if you're setting up a, a joint or joining a private practice across country and you didn't know anybody I think that would be very hard to know who to contact for things so that's why I joined Kaiser and I, I very much appreciate working for them um, we have another question. How do you find a diagnostic process to be different from adult patients since patient narrative could be affected? <laughs> In other words, children sometimes don't talk. <laughs> well, this is where the family dynamics come into. You have to be able to interview the, the parents because you have to trust. I mean, you have to be able to trust the parent's word and know how to ask questions of the family. And you also... Um, one of the things that drew me to pediatrics in some ways is I think probably why I like wanted to be a vet is the, to me, I think some people have a hard time with this, but to me, like if you can see a small creature being an animal or a child that's nonverbal, I, I usually can tell if they're in pain or if they're happy or, you know, you can tell if they're looking sick or not just by one glance where I think it becomes older, the more motivations, I mean, it becomes harder, the more ulterior motivations and, um, um, you know, like embarrassment, um, seeking gain, you know, all, all these other things that go into play with an older adult. You have to learn, it's a different set of skills to work around and, and tease that out. And it's true of teenagers for sure. <laughs> but, but, um, but that's, I, don't, I think you can, you can tell if a kid's in pain or not by just looking at them. They're pretty honest. Until tell, tell about, you know, late middle school, <laughs> middle school age. <laughs> Um, this like um, correlates with the CPS like issue. Um, do you have to like wait for CPS or can you just talk to the child directly about issues going on with it them? It depends on the situation. Like just for instance, for um, sexual abuse of a young child, you do not want to... Um, a thing of, of you know changing the narrative by just
I'm sorry, we seem to be having some technical difficulties at the moment. I'm back. Sorry, I don't know what happened. Can you please repeat that because you got cut off? Uh, like, I, I, you started. I'm so, so sorry. <laughs> what was I saying? Like an older kid who knows you, you know, you can believe. I, it, it depends on the situation and the developmental age of the kid, basically. That's why pediatric is so different because you have, you know, developmental ages, you have infants that are can barely lift their heads and work on focusing on your face and that's about all they can do. They don't know that their hands exist and then you watch them grow up and change and discover that they have hands and start being able to look and smile and interact and start moving their bodies and then they start to talk and start, you know, then everything's fun and new. So, it, you know, that's, you have to know that how children develop and how their bodies change and both you know, mentally and uh, physically, including adolescence. <laughs> Since we're on the topic of adolescence, how does adolescent and parent relationship impact your practice? Uh, well, it's a different dynamic, right? Because in California, at least, adolescents have the right to consent to uh, a confidential treatment involving sexuality and sex and stuff like that without their parents' consent. So you have to be able to navigate kicking the mom and dad out of the room. I usually say it's my, I'm hoping you guys have talked about this in your home already, but um, it's my job to be your doctor, not your parents' doctor. And this, this is, these are your rights. And do I need to ask you these questions to make sure we're safe, you're safe. And I, you have to tell the parents. I usually try to tell the parents around the, you know, 11, 12 year visit, you know, the next time they come, they're gonna be kicked out of the room and, <laughs> and they should have these talks with their children to begin with because if their child decides to talk to me about something that they don't wanna talk to the parent about, guess what parents, you don't get to know. <laughs> so to have those talks. Um, I know we've like briefly went over about it, but do you have any tips to any aspiring doctors out there? Um, I think you have to be sure of what you want to do because it's a, it's a tough road. <laughs> it's a it was a it's a tough journey, and sometimes there's not great work life balance, and <laughs> and um, especially if you're not in a subspecialty, like if you're in a in primary care, which would be like basically, you know, internal medicine, family practice, pediatrics. Um, you don't get paid as much as the other kinds of doctors. I have a question. You talked a little bit about um, work-life balance. Can you elaborate a little bit more about that? How is it, um, how do you balance having um, your medical career and having a family life at home? Well, the, I mean, it goes, what I just said, you have to find it worth it. You have to feel like it's worth it to you. Um, certainly residency is very difficult. Um, and med school takes a lot of time too, but residency in particular, I don't think it's as quite as the same as it used to be because I started pre there being a law that you a limitation on how long you had to, could work before you were allowed to rest. So we did, you know, 48 hour shifts. <laughs> so, and then, or, and then three nights, three nights, every third night, you'd be on call and work overnight and then go home the next day at 3 p.m. So that, that's can be really, really hard, but they don't, now I think you get to go home after 24 hours. <laughs> So, um, uh, you, and, you know, in some ways, like, I missed all of Sex in the City and Seinfeld, <laughs> like, I don't remember, I did not, never saw any of that, <laughs> uh, but on the other hand, you, I mean, the, and the other side is you have to have a supportive family, and, because I don't know, <laughs> 
I, I wouldn't have been able to do this without my husband who was able, was able to take care of the kids more. Um, you went over like um, you have to be like sure that you want to do this if you want to become a doctor There was a question that like correlates to this Were there any moments during your pre-med journey or during med school where you reconsidered becoming a doctor? If so, how did you bounce back from that? Um, that's yes Yes, there's, there's been moments, I mean, I think it helped to just like to go, you know what, if you can't do this, you could go live on in, you know, go live in Mexico somewhere. <laughs> I think anybody has those thoughts sometimes. But then the flip side is when you get the affirmations from colleagues or patients and families, it's especially that you've made an impact for them, then even if you feel like you are not the best as you want to be, you still feel like you're making a difference. It's really a privilege to be able to take, to, to, to have a job that you feel like you can make a difference for someone. It really is. I mean, it's really a privilege to have a job right now. <laughs> so, um, period. But it's a, it's a privilege to have a job that you can actually feel like you can make an impact with someone's life. So um, since, a good partner is my tip. <laughs> um, since most of us are like an undergrad, do you have any advice for people who's navigating imposter syndrome while in undergrad or in med school? Oh, that doesn't go away. Sorry. <laughs> imposter syndrome is real. <laughs> and if you if it if you don't have a little bit of imposter syndrome, you're probably not humble enough. <laughs> So if that makes sense. <laughs> um, this is more about like working with other people. What is your experience with PAs, NPs, and other healthcare workers other than doctors? Um, I don't, I haven't had a chance to work with many PAs. I know some of the subsurgical, a lot more of the surgical subspecialists use that. Um, <laughs> like for outpatient, they tend to be, be able to specialize and work right underneath a particular, um, in, in one particular field, underneath the supervision of a doctor. We do have a few, we did, I did work and do work with a few NPs who um, did carry a practice, but then they've moved more to just working for the well newborn nursery. So it, it, I think it depends on the network you're part of and, and how much they incorporate MPs and PAs. Um, you briefly went over like being thankful for having a job during these times and like everything's like online now most of, for most of us at least like students. Um, what changed during like the COVID pandemic like with your work life now? It slowed down a little bit now, but for a while there it was every few days we'd have an update. And we still have like every, <laughs> every, um, twice a week little updates on what's new in, in at least Kaiser's response to COVID that we have to kind of stay up with. So, um, um, lots of things have changed. Like our, within Kaiser at least, we went from, something like 90% in-person care to something like about 40% in-person and 60% telehealth or something like huge shift like that. So we've been doing a lot more like um, video visits and online and phone visits and stuff. Uh, and then just precautions and, and reformulating, you know, waiting room space and contacts with people and, and, um, being safe and everything. Um, I'm gonna, the, the, the downside of the, this career is, um, again, the work-life balance and feeling like sometimes I had, haven't been able to do a lot of the things that I wanted to do in my life, but I'm finding time.
gets better as you get older and your kids grow up. <laughs> and I, I have seen kids who have recovered from COVID, but not, um, most of the diagnosis is done through the telehealth and, and drive throughs so. Um, you've talked about how 90% of your, like in Kaiser at least, is mostly inpatient. Can you talk about the difference between inpatient and out? Yeah, I meant um, in person. Like, oh, sorry. But so can we, you we shifted from doing a lot, like a lot of in-person care to a lot more video and telehealth, telehealth, basically. But to your question of the difference between inpatient and outpatient pediatrics or any spe uh, specialty, Inpatient is where you're dealing with in the hospital, somebody sick enough to be in the hospital. Um, and, that, and then outpatient would be everything that's not staying overnight in the hospital or in the emergency room. Emergency room is probably considered inpatient. Does that answer your question? Yes, thank you. Um, oh. you talk about different like types of employment because you like work for Kaiser would be different with like working in a private practice or like this a is, clinic. This this goes to like what I was talking about working for Kaiser a little bit earlier. That when you when you become a physician, you have to think about what kind of practice environment you would want want to work for, and you know this may shift as in the coming years for instance. So, you know, traditional and old fashioned would be a, a private practice, either solo or small group, where you have a few practitioners that own and operate their own practice. Um, but then you individually have to negotiate with each of the insurance and decide what kind of insurance you want to take and then build them and such. You can be part of a larger group practice, which is sort of the same thing, but in a, you know, like maybe a lot more physicians in a group. Um, you could be part of a large group HMO, which is what Kaiser is. This also would qualify as, as a um, integrated healthcare plan where everything's all in one. HMOs are a form of way of billing for insurance where you get um, have to meet certain quality measures and they have caps on th certain things and for payment. Um, it's a, I don't, I'm not the best with talking about all the different kinds, but, um, and you might be a group practice within a large, within an HMO. You could also be a part of a hospital base, like maybe a teaching hospital that runs a clinic, or you might work as a hospitalist or an inpatient doctor for a hospital and be employed by the hospital. But then depending on some hospitals are for profit, some are nonprofit and some you know, are part of only accept HMOs and some are part of different networks and private networks. So there's all these different fee structures that, that you would have. Locum tenens means that you basically work covering, work, go around working for, it's like a traveling nurse, like where you can go anywhere and practice for a certain contracted time you know, maybe someone's going on a sabbatical or on maternity leave for an extended period, they might hire someone who, who's um, for a locum tenens organization and you would step in for temporary spots, basically, so. Awesome, thank you so much, Catherine, uh, Dr. Valois, sorry. Um, <laughs> at this time, <laughs> guys, just background information, Dr. Catherine Valois is um, one of my family friends. So I'm very used to just referring to her as Catherine, um, having trouble making the switch. Um, at this time, we'd like to open it up for our q and It's gonna be an open forum um, type. So feel free to um, share your videos, unmute yourselves, um, we're gonna be, trying to do this in the most orderly fashion. There's currently 65 participants. Um, so please try to utilize the raise hand button and um, Dr. Valois will be uh, calling you out by name for your question. I am? Okay. <laughs> yeah. I don't know how to um, tell if someone raised their hand. I think, yeah, you, should um, pick, I think you should pick the questions. <laughs> okay. All right. So we have one question in the chat. How did you overcome internal battles um, when struggling academically? We clearly have a group of type A's here in this group. <laughs> like, 
I don't know any doctor that isn't a perfectionist to some degree because you just can't get there without it. So there, all, there comes a point in all of our, for you or if you haven't reached it yet, you get in there where you're no longer the, the, the smartest fish in the little pool. You're gonna meet smarter and smarter people and you're gonna, it's gonna get harder and harder and harder. So at a certain point, there's gonna be that class that breaks you. <laughs> For me, it was organic chemistry where <laughs> the pass, the pa it was on, a cur was on a curve and the passing rate was like 50 to 40% right or something. <laughs> it was so hard. <laughs> <laughs> but um you, you you have to be able to say at some point i'm I, what will be will be and i'm going to work as hard as i can and then that's it i still i i i just have to take care of myself you cannot function as well as you can if you don't get at least some sleep you will never do the best work that you can <laughs> if you pull all nighters although i did a lot of those in my college days <laughs> but um you do need to have some balance just to be sane and you have to forgive yourself if you if you really did the best that you can eh, you did the best you can move on um is it difficult or easy um to maintain personal relationships in terms of your family significant others during medical school specifically Uh, I, the hardest part is I would fall asleep all the time. <laughs> I would go out to dinner and I'd fall asleep. I would fall asleep standing up. <laughs> so, so that was hard for my family to really understand the depth of fatigue and how sleep starved I was. And for years afterwards, I'm very jealous about my sleep because, <laughs> because, um, I was just so tired all the time. So they had trouble understanding why, you know, I tried to be social and I just couldn't do it. Just fall asleep at the bar, fall asleep <laughs> at the restaurant. So that was the harder part. But, you know, again, if you have a really supportive partner that believes in you and what they're, what you're doing and has goals, similar goals of life for you and will be your life partner, you can get through it. Thank you. Oh, We're gonna. Yeah. Um, oh, sorry. Well, I, but I did consider if I I said to myself if I didn't get in the second time of applying for med school, I would consider doing a PA. Um, so yes, I did think about it. Okay, I'm gonna ask um, one of our students to unmute um, so that they could ask their question. Um, hi. So I have a question on like regarding like workload like college versus medical school how is that like different and does it does it get like i'm not gonna say easier but was like the content more interesting once you got to medical school that's tricky i went to a, a college that was very um didactic very uh you had to think a lot <laughs> and honestly a lot of medical school is memorization and it only gets interesting when you finally get to start seeing patients in in third and fourth year because then you're for me i don't learn well with just memorization and um and rote stuff but it, i i learn much better with hands-on and practical and so when i could see a disease manifest in a person and learn about it that way was much easier. But I found that um, pet school was a lot more just rote memorization than anything. Is that going to take a question? Uh, yeah, um, thank you. All right, and then we're going to take our Go ahead. So I put all my question in the comments, but um, it was when looking at medical schools, what, quali what qualities did you look for in these institutions? And how did you know that the one that you attended was the right fit? I don't remember. I, I think it worked out because I, I ended up with in-state tuition and stuff, which was really nice. <laughs> Made a huge difference. <laughs> but um. 
can't remember. I don't even remember what I got into or not. Sorry. <laughs> first two tips for the first two year of medical school would be um, make friends, especially if you're the kind of person that needs, it depends on um, how you learn, right? If you know you learn by talking with people and, and discussing things, then make a group, a study group for sure. You know, I, you know, you have to know how you learn and then play to your strengths. So like color, like I did the anatomy coloring book because it was actually helpful for me just to have, you know, if you, some, if you combine two or more senses when you're trying to memorize something, you, you do a lot better. So like if you could speak aloud or make a rhyme or if you can pick, make a picture in your head or a silly story or, you can, or if you remember it but by talking to someone else, you just need to know your, um, your ways of your strengths and how you particularly learn. Um, do I ever feel isolated? Yes, but I'm an introvert, so it's not very, it's not bad. <laughs> like I said, I missed all of certain, you know, types of music and TV shows in my med school and in residency years. Um, and I, I, it depends on your personal personality. There's a, a lot of, this brings me, it makes me think of, uh, there's a lot of being a doctor is, you, you are a little bit on stage all the time when you're with parents and families because you don't necessarily have to can you don't you can there are often times where you can't be honest with your emotions <laughs> like if you just had a very difficult di like you had to tell something some somebody some really bad news five minutes later you had to go to your next patient and say hey how's it going <laughs> you know you have to be a little bit of an actor and you have to be a little bit of a teacher because you have to be able to teach families and kids and about how to care for themselves and their bodies and what to watch for and signs of illness you have to be a good communicator so I I um, find it I often need to just not be around people when I get home some people would really thrive on that interaction but it, it's a lot of acting and um, I want to I don't want to say salesmanship but it you have to be you you're you are performing in some ways dr Valwa, i have a question can you walk us through your you know daily routine when you first oh, yes. get to work oh yes um i'm gonna talk about it pre-covid because things are i guess it's not too much different but now we don't see any sick kids in the office they get sent to a different place <laughs> into a different <laughs> office so it's all separated now. So there's a lot more triaging before they get into the door, basically, because we're trying to keep everybody safe. But I, my day is usually patients are working from 8.30 to 5.30, basically. But um, I'm on salary. So whatever work I accumulate during that time, I just have to do. <laughs> so I usually try to get to work at eight and check my messages and start doing things. We have a little uh, clinic huddle for about 10 minutes in the morning where we talk about the issues of the day and what's coming and the schedule and and um with all the staff and that you know as a tip for medical students and um especially if you are a resident or always treat your staff nice never piss off the nurses just a bad idea <laughs> um <laughs> and so then, then usually first patient is 845 and every 15 minutes is a new patient. Some, and you have messages and emails that, I, that you check and take care of in between. Um, sometimes there are phone calls you have to make in between two. Um, like a, a typical visit would be like a, a well baby visit where they come and register at the receptionist they, who checks their insurance and 
checks them in and then they are given questionnaires about healthy baby development and how there are any concerns that they might have that my medical assistant will weigh them and measure them if an older kid take their blood pressure do vision and hearing and then they um then they their rooms then i go through all their all their questionnaires and talk go in and talk to them review their growth um, review their development address any concerns they might have it's all on computer it used to be on paper um and then if they are getting shots after the visit my lvn will come in and get their vaccinations and then they will go home and i will go to the next person and um first if it used to be there'd be sick visits in there as well so you know that might mean sending the kid to, to either the, ph the pharmacy or the lab or the x-ray and having them come back or depending on what the um, issue is and maybe arranging a follow-up depending on what the, the issue is and uh and in between you're answering emails and phone calls that are coming in the messages uh and that often we have lunch meetings for either um, medical education lunch meetings or or um, just operational lunch meetings <laughs> and then last patient is usually about 5 30 but I usually don't finish till about 6 and then I usually chart till 7 and sometimes I go home and chart after that after dinner too so chart meaning finish up writing on each individual patient a couple um, questions oh. If everybody gets trained in neonatology as a pediatrician, you would have to do rotate through neonatology. And as a, when I first started um, working, I was a hybrid, so I would do overnights in the neonatal unit. Um, and yes, everybody should be vaccinated. Not even a question. I, I almost wore my vaccinate t-shirt to this. <laughs> um, there's a question. During residency, did you work with just pediatric related patient? Or was it array of types of patients? Just pediatrics. Because when you're in a residency, you're in a residency for X. So you're a residency for internal medicine. You're a residency for surgery. You're in a residency. So certain surgical subspecialties, you have to do a general year first. So like if you're going to be a radiologist, you have to do a, general, a first year intern year and in maybe internal medicine. If you're going to go into orthopedics you'd have to do a first year of general surgery first and then go into orthopedic surgery or if you're going to be uh you, but for pediatrics it's all pediatrics um i have another question related to that how was your residency in pediatrics pediatric residency is three years um First, the first year you're, you're called an intern and then your second year and then a third year a senior resident. You will have your MD at that point or you should be licensed to. So you could get go to medical school and then become a consultant for a TV show, for instance, <laughs> and not do a residency and you could still have an MD after your name. But um, uh, when you're in a residency, you're going on to get a certification that hopefully you can get a board certification. So board, American Board of Pediatrics, um, you know, it, for instance, is my board. So it's a three-year residency for pediatrics. I think in, uh, internal medicine, I think is two years. Um, some specialties like OBGYN, I think is five. General surgery is five. If you want to do like subspecialty after surgery, then it would be additional training after that. So I know if you wanted to do a pediatric subspecialty, it would be additional years after your general pediatric residency. So then you would still be, you would be called a, a fellow at that point. So, um, att attending someone that finished their residency and has privileges to admit patients to that particular hospital is what an attending is in supervised residence. Um, I have a question here. What extracurriculars were you a part of during your first two years of medical school? Like example, like scribing or research, something like that? No, nah, not much time to. I did sing in a community choir <laughs> and that was about it. <laughs> did 
didn't do anything else <laughs> but study. Um, how is like a relationship between like an attending or a resident like? How what does that seem like? It depends on the attending, right? So the attending is supposed to be responsible for teaching you. It depends though. If you're in a residency program, then your attending is the one that's directly in, um, overseeing you. But there are some pro places that an outside uh, solo practitioner might come in is also an attending, but may not be the, your teaching attending. So, and it depends if they're nice people or not. Um, and can you just bad um, residents? too so can you describe the process of matching with a residency program oh i don't this has been a while it's called the match and it happens every march and you basically list your you go out on interviews before that and in programs that you like and then they list who they want in their program and you list your top programs and they match them and make a big list and you match to program and then you have to go there. And there's some people that couples match, for instance, if, if there's a married couple, they both wanna to go to a particular city, then they might weigh them in the big, it's like a big algorithm, I imagine. Um, since tuition is like a big thing for like medical students or planning to like pursue medicine, um, did you take out any loans for med school and residency programs since you don't have like time to like do anything else? No, um, physician debt is huge. Most people finish residency with, you do get paid in residency, but it's like for the hours out your work, it's less than minimum wage. <laughs> but um, so a lot of physicians start their career with, you know, hundreds and thousands of dollars in debt. Um, I was fortunate in that, well, I, through personal deaths in the family, I was able to um, inherit some money that helped me. And I en ended up going to a state school, which helped a lot too. So, so um, the in-state tuition was much better. This is a good question. Um, do medical schools value traditional pre-med extracurriculars like research over unrelated experiences like journaling or designing? I don't know. I think they do want you to excel in the pre-med course, but as far as what I would guess, if how they weigh them, I don't know. I think they, if I were them, I would want someone that's well-rounded, who is solid in their sciences, but you may have more to give, like say if you volunteered you know, as a voter outreach in an underserved community and had multiple languages, you may have more to offer than someone that just, you know, stayed in a lab the whole time. And, and it depends on what kind of medicine too that you're thinking about going into pathology, sitting in a lab versus, you know, um, uh, you know, health, epidemiology or working for the state or something, you know, there's, there's different kinds of experiences that might match better with different kinds of medicine. So I don't know, it's been a while for me, sorry. Um, since like we're mostly college students and like working in groups, especially during COVID is very important. Do you think this translates to like where you are in life right now in your job? Can you say that one more time? Sorry. Oh, sorry. Um, since um, working in groups is very important in college students right now, do you think this um, skill translates to your like job right now? In like being a doctor. I mean, working in group teams and stuff. Yeah. I think that is a whole new shift in education since I came up. So, um, and some people do better with that than others. I think. The part that would translate well is like you really are as a doctor at least i see myself as part of a, a team in my clinic i have my medical assistants my nurses my my rns my lvns my you know managers the other doctors and we we have to respect and work with each other and we have to know each other's roles and learn to trust and rely on each other so those skills 
would translate well to that. But like on the other hand, once I get in the room, I am the provider and I'm the doctor. And so nobody else is making the decision out beyond that. Um, if you're able to, can you talk about how hard the recertification exams are? Um, I won't, I think you have to do it every, there's, there's different components to it as, as far as in pediatrics. I think in OBGYN they have to still do oral exams, which sounds horrific to me. <laughs> I don't think I would like to sit for an oral board. Um, the recertification, it's not just an exam. You have to show that you've had a certain amount of um, medical education that's approved by the board, like for, you know, 40 hours of this and 40 hours of practice improvement plans and 40 hours of um, different things. And then you have to take your exam. Um, it used, I'm, the, the first time I recertified, it was, you had to go to like the Qualtrics, same place, you know, those computer places where you take your SAT and stuff and they sit you down and they make you put everything, they give you your, you can take a pencil in or something and, you know, and they go through in the computer, it was a two day exam, eight hours a day. Um, this, this year, this, this cycle of recertification, I'm doing it in chunks online where um, they send me questions, like 30 questions every, every three months, basically, something like that. And you just have to complete it over, the, over several years and get a certain percentage right. Um, do they give you materials to prepare for the exam? Or like, and do you have to learn new material? For it? You always have to learn new materials. They don't give you any materials, but you're, you're responsible for knowing the current research and, and current up-to-date recommendations, which is always changing. <laughs> like we used to tell people not to give peanuts till after one year of age, but now we know through, through a big, huge study based on certain cultures that introduced peanut products at a young age, like as a, one of the first foods that they had way lower incidence of peanut allergies. So they did a huge study and found that um, earlier introduction of peanut products to a child's diet is preventive for peanut allergy. So we have, so that's a huge shift. And like before I started practicing, people didn't know about what, what were risk factors for sudden infant death. So they would tell people so but then we figured out that putting a baby down on their tummy was a risk factor so back to sleep campaign started and we've had dramatic and decrease in crib deaths for that so they, you know you, you have to there are people out there doing research and studying and you know uh, there are new vaccines that come out there are new um, drugs that come out you have to be up to date with all that and that's why they require you to do certain amount of medical education every year so that you have the opportunity to stay up to date. So on the topic of vaccines, what are your stands? Because I know some parents don't allow their children to um, receive vaccines. Uh, I just want to know your point of view on it. <laughs> um, There's a, been a lot of research showing that the, and you can't, I, can't, I can't talk about the text, no politics, that the more you, more you um, argue with someone, especially if it's part of how they see as their identity, if they, if they identify as a certain, with a certain group of people, a certain culture, and you argue with them, then you're not, you, they're not going to listen to the, the the logic behind any argument. You have to, the, the, because you're actually challenging their identity, right? So this goes to like Democrat, Republican versus someone that's you know believes that vaccines are are harmful. And no matter what science and facts that you spew at them, they're not going to hear it if that belief is part of their if they're their social group and their their identity. So the first priority is make is is creating a um, a shared identity, a shared purpose. So the health of your child, 
we are both worried about this. And then you open the discussion. If they really shut down, you don't want to push them. You just have to move on. But if you can talk about it and see if you can ad address some of their fears while building a rapport and a, a shared um, uh, understanding, then you can sometimes win people over over time. So. Okay, thank you. And then um, there's a question, a scenario question in the chat. It says, if two children come into the emergency room at the same time and one is crying while the other is silent, which do you attend first and why? It depends on the reason why they're there and what they look like. Okay. <laughs> crying children are usually breathing children, put it that way. <laughs> okay, so you would take the silent one? Well, if the, the silent one's playing with the toy and smiling, okay, for the situation based. if the silent one is limp and pale and blue lips, <laughs> right? Right, right. Okay, and then another question is, do you still conduct research or participate in research outside of your pediatric practices? I don't. I think my, a lot of my colleagues do. I've, um, again, part of the work-life balance, I find my joy is in just regular everyday pediatrics and not necessarily, um, I don't feel like I have the extra energy to put into that, honestly, but there's plenty of opportunities to do so. I, you know, I have a lot of colleagues that do that. Um, how often is mental health a part of your career or like your practice? Uh, always. <laughs> For instance, we are, we have we are often the first. This is, goes back to the pediatrician being part of the the care of the family. Like we are seeing the moms after postpartum deliver after delivery before that their OB often sees them after they go home to the hospital, and so we do the screening for, for postpartum depression, and then and and then you know in, you know, families, parents that are depressed or don't bond as well with their babies, you know, it has, can have a profound effect with their, how they raise their children. Um, I don't know if anybody, sorry, if, don't know if anybody knows what ACEs are. Do you know, anybody know what ACEs are? Adverse childhood experiences? So you, you ought to, you all should know this because it's hugely impactful. Hold on. No. Um, <laughs> um, adverse childhood experiences are, are things that stress a child's environment or a child's physiology out, um, uncompensated stress. And they include, they are, let me see if I get them all right. Um, they would be, having a parent separation from a parent, having experienced abuse or being exposed to abuse, a, a parent who uses drugs or is addicted to drugs or alcohol, um, mental illness in the family. Um, I'm gonna miss some of them, but if you look up ACEs and um, like the CDC has a big website about this. Where they are. It's the first thing that comes up if you Google it. But if you have unopposed stress as a child in, while your brain is growing, it alters how your brain handles stress and stress hormones for your entire rest of your life. And there's certain ACEs so that if you have more than, it, it might get the, the, the statistics wrong, but if you have more than three ACEs, your chance of dying, your, age of, your average age of death decreases by 10 years you're much more likely to get cancer. You're much more likely to have early heart disease or stroke. So this has to do with things that happen to you as a child impact, um, impacts adult health comes. There's no stronger predictor of adult health, health outcomes as, as their ACEs score, okay? So we try to screen children and families for ACEs to try to reach out and help families build resilience and, and get support that they need. Unfortunately, health 
health care, I, I mean, mental health care is so difficult. It's, there, there's not nearly enough health care, uh, mental health providers and, and insurance that covers it and supports in the community. So that's, so yeah, mental health is important. <laughs> Um, how did you develop your bedside manner or like acting? Did you always have an exceptional communication skills or did you just develop them over time? No, <laughs> I'm sure I've become a lot more straightforward. And like, I remember being as a medical student, being embarrassed to ask like grown adult men about how many sex partners they've had and stuff like that. You know, like, it's just, I was so, such a shy kid growing up. So, so but um. Uh, just to practice and 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 I'm sure my style of talking to families is and I know you know sometimes families fire me and they move on to somebody else you know you know it, it's funny because we are all really close as my my group practice is really close so we talk about people <laughs> and families amongst ourselves but there's certain I mean there's different I, I, I've definitely changed in how I present myself and just through practice. Oh, sorry. Um, um, how did you prepare for the uh, step one and step two of the exams? Well, this was early internet days, so there wasn't like, <laughs> so we had like books. <laughs> <laughs> and so I read books and did like paper quizzes and stuff. <laughs> but I would imagine now that there's things like, you know, online practice tests and stuff that you can do. That's, I found that the easiest rather than just rote studying practice tests is I find the easiest. But again, it depends on how you learn. Did you generally, um, while you were studying in medical school, did you personally go um, in a group or were you more a lone studier? I was more of a lone studier. Mm -hmm. And do you have any studying tips that you'd be able to share with us? Uh, I think I've mentioned them before, like you can only study so much you have to balance your rest and your exercise and your nutrition because <laughs> there's a certain point where you, if you're less lacking in one of those things, then no matter how much you study, it's not going to stick. And you got to know your limits for that and pay attention to especially sleep. Um, um, and then know how you know, learn. Like you, singing a song <laughs> to, to something that you have to memorize is, or make, works well, or learning mnemonics, or learning silly stories, you know, like we all know uh, red, blue, green, you know, the rain, the rainbow mnemonic and stuff. So, you, I mean, and I still can recite the presidents because I, I learned it to a song in elementary school. So learn how you learn, and then, um, and it, I think the best way to learn for most people is combining two different senses. So speaking aloud or writing while you're taking notes, even if you never look at the notes again. Um, the fact that you are writing while you're taking notes keeps you engaged with the speaker and, and the, the act of writing and the motor act helps you remember things. So um, highlighting, you know, it, it, when you engage more than one um, sense, it helps learn. Um, can you describe the difference between DO and MD and how can that affect future job opportunities after school? Um, the second part of that question, it doesn't really affect any future job opportunities after school. I think DOs are just as, um, there's, no, there's no difference, there's no bias. I think they're traditionally taught a few more um, hands-on physical medicine things like um, I, I was an MD not a DO but as I understand things like using massage and um, 
like hands-on manipulation of the body, um, a lot they're taught a lot more of that in there. But I don't know much more than that. But there's not really any difference beyond the school. Um, we're close to the end. Do you have any last tips or like advice for future doctors or pre-med students? Um, it kind of goes, like when reading this last question here, what, what are your thoughts about wanting to pursue another career before making sure MD is the correct path? There's two sides to that. And I guess it's the advice, the big point is you really have to want to be a doctor. For me, it was, I, I really enjoyed the thought and it was kind of an easy track. So I found, I found comfort and security in knowing that once I was on this path, it was, um, you know, I had a, I knew what was going to happen next, right? Whereas if you go into another career, you have to, I think, depending on what you're choosing, be able to accept a lot more uncertainty in your future career. Um, when you're in this point as undergrads, if you're thinking about it, it's a whole lot easier to change out of being pre-med than to change into pre-med. So you, so, and being pre-med can still have open doors to you in all sorts of different um, careers. So you, so while you're figuring it out, <laughs> so you don't have to commit now if you're undergrad is my advice. I think we lost Nina. <laughs> oh. Yeah, I am. Um, all right. Thank you so much um, for joining us today, Dr. Bawa. It was a pleasure to hear you speak. Um, at this time, students, um, there is, if you would like, a certificate verifying your participation today. Um, Raf, can we get the next slide, please? Thank you. Um, one more. Um, so you want to log back into our website, and this is how you are able to take the quiz. So you are going to sign back into www.prehealthshadowing.com. Um, make sure you are signed into your account. Um, once you are signed in, you're going to want to go to the events page and click on Dr. Valois. Um, once you get there, you're going to see uh, this first step up in the upper left corner where it says next to her name on the right, it's going to say free, take this course. This course is what we were hoping to have open. Unfortunately, at the beginning, we had a lot of traffic on our website, which is a very good thing, but unfortunately, it crashed our site, um, and a lot of students actually weren't able to join because of that. Um, so we are going to work on navigating that for our next session this Friday. Um, so once you click take this course, you will be put inside a module, similar to how many of our um, Canvas things are. Um, at school. Um, you're gonna very briefly, since you guys are already in the Zoom, you just have to click the Zoom link. You can exit out right away. Once you click the Zoom link, it'll prompt you to go to the next page. Um, and that will be the quiz. Once you get to the quiz, there's gonna be a big old start button, like in step three, you can take that quiz. This is a very important step. Oh no, I just got worried that the website isn't working. All right, we are going to be fixing that. The, um, please check back. Um, we, I will send an email out to everybody um, when it is fixed. The quiz will be open for one week. Um, so if it doesn't uh, work for you right now, I'm so sorry about that. This is our first um, shadowing session. Um, so we are going to be working on it so that it can be fixed for next time. Um, but once you take the quiz, once you are able to get into it, um, you want to click the back arrow to go back to the original website outside of the module, and that's where you will see this finish course button in step four. Uh, once you click finish course, you will have your certificate. You can download it immediately once you see it, or you can, uh, it'll always be there inside your account, so you can download it at another time. Um, we recommend doing it immediately just for organization purposes. Please let me know if you guys have any questions. Um, I will be staying on the Zoom chat 
if there's any more complications. Again, we are working on fixing the website. It crashed because of the large amount of traffic. Um, oh, okay, website is working for some people. Go ahead and try it out. Um, thank you guys for all of your feedback. I'm, I'm loving it. <laughs> thank you so much for joining us and thank you again, Dr. Valwa, for doing this for us.